Well, okay, then welcome everyone and thank you so much for joining us today. Um, my name is Stephanie Glinsky and I'm a journalist. I've been based here in Afghanistan for the last two years and I'm very much looking forward to the event tonight and the excellent panel that we are having. I'm very glad that you could all join us. Um, also like to thank Conservative Friends of Afghanistan for organizing this event. As many of you know, Conservative Friends of Afghanistan is a group supported by British parliamentarians working to strengthen the diplomatic, military, humanitarian, and development relationships between Afghanistan and the UK. Um, so this is, of course, a very timely discussion that we're having. 2020 has been quite an important year for Afghanistan. We've had earlier this year in February, um, the US and the Taliban signing a deal towards peace and US troop withdrawal, and the forces are scheduled to leave next year, May. Um, and over the last months, also, we have seen an increasing amount of violence throughout the country. Um, the security has been really difficult, and um, there's the likelihood of things to descend into a civil strife. Um, we've seen education centers being attacked, and we've seen targeted assassinations um, widespread throughout the country in different provinces, as, as of course, in the <clears throat> capital, Kabul. Um, since 2003, the military operations are led by NATO, and Afghanistan remains NATO's largest operation to date, and a priority of all NATO members and partner nations, which contribute troops through ISAF, the International Security Assistance Force. Um, so today we want to look a, have a closer look at NATO's diplomatic military strategy in Afghanistan, as well as the Afghan peace process in general. Um, so again, a very welcome to all of our participants today. Um, also welcome to the audience. If you do have any questions, please drop them in the, in the little chat box on the side. We'll, we'll get to those later. And we are hoping to answer as many questions as possible. Um, we'll see how time goes. Um, but now I'm really excited to welcome everybody who's here with us today or tonight, depending on where you are. Um, I'm gonna have a quick introduction of our panelists in alphabetical order. So starting with Hosna Jalil, um, who is Afghanistan's Deputy Minister of Interior Affairs, focusing on strategy and policy. Um, Hosna was actually the first Afghan woman ever to be appointed to such a high post in the Ministry of Interior at the age of 26. Um, she holds a master's degree um, in business and management from the American University of Afghanistan. We have Saad Mousseni, who is the chairman and chief executive of the Mobi Group. And that's one of the fastest growing media companies in South and Central Asia, in the Middle East, as well as in Africa. He was also recognized by Time Magazine as one of the 10 most influential people worldwide in 2011. Um, Shabnam Nasimi is joining us from London. She's a British Afghan political and social activist, as well as founder of and director of the Conservative Friends of Afghanistan, our host today. Um, ambassador Ronald Newman is joining us. He served as the US ambassador to Afghanistan between July 2015 um, to April 2017. And he also wrote a book, The Other War, Winning and Losing in Afghanistan. And he's still very much plugged into current affairs in Afghanistan and currently also um, is an advisor on the board of the nonprofit, um, the School of Leadership in Afghanistan. And then we also have Ambassador Stefano Ponte Corvo. He is NATO's senior civilian representative in Afghanistan, caring for what NATO's political and military objectives in the country. Um, he assumed office this year, earlier this year in June. Prior to that, he was Italy's ambassador to Pakistan, as well as diplomatic advisor to the Italian Defense Ministry between 2013 and 2015. So an amazing, uh, an amazing panel that we have. So welcome again to all of you. Um, and I don't want to I don't want to delay any longer, um, and I'd like to dive in right into the questions that we have for today. Um, the first one, I kind of wanted to do a very quick, quick take. Um, so each one of you has about one sentence to answer this question, and then we'll move into a more elaborate response later. Um, but for this one, please stay with one sentence, and then and then we'll move things forward. Um, so yeah, let's dive right in. So if we look at the peace talks, uh, if peace talks are successful, what, in your opinion, is the best case scenario 
that you envision? And at the same time, if they're not successful, what would the alternative be? Um, if you could just take a brief moment to think about that and then give us your one sentence answer for each one of these scenarios. Um, I'm not gonna call any of you out. So whoever wants to go first, please. I'm not shy, so I'll go first. Nobody else is shy either, but I mean, I'll go first anyway. I mean, if, uh, if in one sentence, it, if the peace process is successful, we will have a peaceful, stable Afghanistan, which builds on the, a bit more Islamic, but which builds on the talks, on the gains of the last 20 years which were made not by the Westerners, but by Afghan society under the blanket of security we provided. If they don't work on there, I'm not gonna speculate and that's why I can be, I can be very brief. Thank you. I'll go next. Um... Well, first of all, thank you, Steph, for moderating today's timely and important discussion um, and for our distinguished panelists for joining us. If the peace talks are successful, I think the best case scenario would be finally an end to the decades of, of terror and war um, and a political settlement that brings the long awaited peace to the country and hopefully a thriving economy that will improve the livelihoods. Uh, because at the end of the day, the way to prosperity is the economy. If not successful, um, I, I don't want to speculate, but from the sentiment that we're receiving from Afghanistan, the alternative would be a likelihood of some sort of descent into a civil strife. I'm asking Newman should go next. All right, I, 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 saw you, I saw you twitching, Saad, so I was... <laughs> I was going to wait. Uh, well, it, you know, it seems to me that any agreement in Afghanistan is agreed in principle, then it's agreed in detail, and then you negotiate or fight about how the details are carried out. So if what you mean by what's the, the scenario of a successful peace, if you mean the day after it is signed, I think the first would be a long testing period to see if it can be kept or if it will be broken. Uh, getting through that period successfully without breaking down into huge violence will already be a major success. Beyond that, that's so far out in the future, I can't look beyond that. Um, what happens if it fails depends both on Afghans, whether government opposition leaders pull together uh, and whether the foreigners continue an adequate funding, particularly for the Afghan security forces. So the, I, I, don't th I think the question has to be answered in terms of those variables. It, it doesn't have an abstract answer. Dad, do you want to go next? Uh, yes, yeah, so I, I think that uh, peace would probably mean a watered down version of what we have. Uh, we probably have to compromise on, on some of the things that we're accustomed to in Afghanistan, whether it's women, women's rights or freedom of expression, and a low temperature insurgency. Uh, however, uh, the situation will probably be an improvement in terms of security to what we have today. And if we don't have peace, where we, it's very likely that we will have a full-on civil war. Thank you. Hasna, do you want to go next? Yes. Um, um, if I may respond in one sentence, if the peace negotiations or the talks succeed, then we will have a reduction in violence. At the same time, we'll have a proportional ceasefire, I would say, which would enable us in order to pave the way for econo economic development at the same time to, for um, um, I would say a social level peace, which is a more sustainable peace. Um, and if the peace talks and the peace negotiation, and at the same time, 
um, if it succeeds, it helps us in order to go deeper when it comes to the negotiation of the details of um, how the, the um, integration and at the same time how the, um, 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 I mean, how, how the inclusive government would look like in terms of having them uh, joining the, the forces at the same time joining the political power, uh, I would say. And if it fails, um, there will be a bloodier fight. Um, and if we look into the, the uh, data of, of at least the last 10 years, um, and if we look at the casualty on the other side, it will be bloodier for them. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I think, yeah, a good intro to, to think exactly about that. What's, what's going to happen to Afghanistan? And if we, if we look at the past, we've seen almost 20 years of a US-led invasion um, even longer since Afghans have enjoyed peace. And the young generation has now grown up in this war. Millions of people have left. The wounds are very deep and the pain is very raw. So there's a lot of trauma and a lot of unanswered questions. And these will remain, of course. There are countless of victims um, who might never receive justice. And then security in the country, of course, continues to be a concern, especially with the US troops leaving. Um, Ambassador Stefano Pontecorvo, I'd like to ask you a question. How, how do you see NATO's diplomatic and military strategy in Afghanistan going forward? Yeah, well, it, it's pretty straightforward, actually, because what we're, we, you know, NATO has uh, endorsed and, uh, the, the, the U.S. Taliban agreement. We're abiding by it in, uh, in uh, support of the peace process. We're drawing down to be ready to leave if that is the, if that is the, if that is the, the political decision which will be made by NATO at a certain point, if the conditions are right, you know, the Secretary General continues to, to talk about the conditions-based retreat and uh, those conditions will have to be assessed. On the other hand, uh, what we, 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 we do always, in our view, in, uh, in keeping with the U.S. Taliban agreement, without any doubt, but in, uh, in, uh, in assisting, how can I say, to inject a bit of realism into the peace process and in the Taliban part, we continue to train, advise, assist, and assist, means assist, the the ANDSF and you know these uh, unwarranted attacks by the by the by the Taliban. We do believe that, uh, as Ambassador Newman was saying, it's you know a, a credible ANDSF and uh, you know a credible uh, credible military structure and security structure in this country will help the Taliban kind of understand that they can't win it militarily and that they're gonna have to compromise. Not yet the case, but uh, you know we hope it'll uh, they'll sooner or later get the get the message. Hope I've answered your question. Um, sure, yeah, and that's actually interesting um, that you you talked about the A and DSF as well, um, because of course that is one of on, one of the questions: what will continue? Who will continue to train the A and DSF? Um, Ambassador Ronald Newman, um, what do you see the U.S.'s role to be in the future of Afghanistan? And if these peace talks are successful and we see the Taliban integrated into the government, um, do you think the army could be reformed? Do you think the ANDSF could be reformed? And, and who will do this training? Um, kind of, yeah, kind of what, what Ambassador Pontecorvo was saying. How, how will this continue? What, what could this look like in the future? Well, You've got an awful lot of assumptions built into that question, most of many of which I'm not sure I fully agree with. Um, I think you need to unpack this thing one piece at a time. First of all, we're in a period of enormous uncertainty as to what is U.S. policy. Um, you, whatever Mr. Trump says, you have now two and a half months left of this administration. Um, you have a situation in which we, uh, Secretary, former Secretary today, Esper, uh, Secretary Pompeo, talked exactly as the Secretary General does about conditions-based withdrawal. And that has, in my judgment, no credibility whatsoever. Conditions are not favorable. Taliban is very questionable. Uh, I, I'm pretty clear that it's not really following the agreement. Um, and I think America has 
little to no credibility right now on the use of the words conditions based. I wish that were not the case. Uh, we already blew that credibility, frankly, in the Obama administration during the drawdowns of 2000, uh, late 2012, 2013, and 14. We talked about conditions based withdrawal, and it was not conditions based. Uh, it, it was a timeline. I was in Afghanistan each one of those years, and as Saad knows, I keep coming back, can't resist. Um, and, and it was clearly not conditions based. So we, we start with little credibility. And now the Taliban aren't really following. The violence is worse. We've accelerated the troop withdrawal faster than the agreement uh, and talked about moving it even faster. So there's, there is little credibility. Now, this period is going to end. What do you get then? I think you get two things. One is the Biden administration is going to take some time to have a, an Afghan policy. It's not going to come in with a fully formed policy. It's going to be overwhelmed dealing with Russia, China, COVID, all sorts of things. And it will probably want a period of review to figure out what it is going to do. Uh, it, I think, I'm just guessing, but it seems to me very logical that the Taliban will increase violence because it will see this as an opportunity to really take control of the situation before the Biden administration makes up its mind. Uh, in consultation with NATO, I think, will be better with a Biden administration, but it can't really consult effectively until it has some idea of what it wants to do itself. And I think you're going to, this is going to be a difficult thing for the Biden administration because it is going, on the one hand, it will want to maintain the, the uh, the approach of counterterrorism, of not having risks to the Western American homeland. It will want to withdraw troops, and it will want to preserve as much as it can of democratic gains and the rights of women. Unfortunately, those goals pull against each other. Uh, they don't go in the same direction very easily. So that on, in a Biden administration, you may have greater sympathy for human rights, rights of women, uh, but also a desire to leave, and you may have a lot of the problem of anti-corruption uh, and things you had before. So that's likely to be a, a messy internal uh, policy debate while the Taliban tries to take the upper hand. And then we have to see. Okay, thank you very much. Um, anybody would like to add anything to that? Um, especially from the NATO side, Stefano Pastorovu. No, well, uh, I heard uh, what the ambassador was saying. You know, in my position, I, I got to be careful what I say, cautious. And you know, I got thirty masters. Uh, actually, one master with uh, thirty masters and one major shareholder, and my own people are looking at me and. Uh, Luckily, I couldn't care less, so it's more or less, but I, I told the line. Now, um, the US, you know, in Afghanistan, that's, that, 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 that's my focus. In Afghanistan, they're not happy, especially after President Trump's tweet, home for Christmas, they're not happy. But um, we're still here, we still have credibility. I think that after you know credibility with the Afghans, that the military side of the house will do what it's what 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 it is committed to do, and it's doing it. It's doing pretty well, as they've shown in Helmand. I mean, so you see some hesitation on Kandahar, which is, uh, I think, prompted by what happened in Helmand, where they took quite a beating, and which is perfectly within the lines of the U.S. Taliban agreement. <clears throat> now. Um, the conditions on there, that, that's above my pay grade. I mean, if I'm, if I were requested of, uh, of, 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 uh, I will be requested actually of, um, what I say, if I think the conditions are there, the conditions, uh, well, I don't think they are yet. And I'm just paraphrasing also what Zal Khalidzad himself said in, uh, during his, uh, you know, his meeting with the North Atlantic Council and, uh, and with the U.S. Congress. <clears throat> We are committed to ANDSF. 
Not in words. I mean, where we, we put our money where, especially the U.S. here in this case, we put our money where where <clears throat> where our mouth is, and we are fully funded until 2024. Great part of that funding comes from uh, from the U.S. There was a call thing called ANA Trust Fund meeting two weeks ago, where all all means 100 percent of the allies have committed funds and committed to staying in Afghanistan if the conditions allow, of course. Uh, of course, to do some sort of training, assist, advice, and so on, on the more difficult part, which is more or less a back office and, and logistics, it's better, it's easier if you're here. You do this, this, this kind of stuff is not done over the horizon or is not done well over the horizon. So now, now we're going to do speculation. <coughs> Will we be still be here? There are two conditions that the Afghan government after RSM folds up sometime. The Afghan government, whatever that will be, will have to invite us and uh, NATO will have to make the political decision to accept that invitation. I see all these, you know, as not in a not too distant future. So let's, let's see what happens. Over. Thank you very much. Um, and yes, a very important point that um, Ambassador Newman also uh, mentioned is the levels of violence going up. And we've seen that a lot throughout the country. We get the CIGAR report out um, and we've seen fighting across the provinces and of course also in the capital Kabul. In recent weeks, we've seen a lot of attacks. Um, some of these have been claimed by the Islamic State, ISK here in Afghanistan. Um, experts have also said that recent attacks in Kabul expose possible divisions within the Taliban over the peace efforts aimed at ending this war. Um, Hosna Jalil, what's, what's your opinion on that? And what efforts is the government taking to decrease levels of violence? Um, many thanks. Um, first, when it comes to the um, division among different layers um, on the Taliban side, I would say Yes, they are divided at the tactical, operational, and strategic or political level. There might be two case scenarios. The first one is um, they have got a unified policy and the tactical and operational level is implementing that, which means their political leaders are not sincere and honest and genuine when it comes to the overall peace talks. They're just playing around, I would say. Um, the second one is they are divided again. And the second case scenario can be um, the tactical and operational level are on one side, the political and the, um, I would say strategic layer is on the other side, but both of them are connected to, uh, I would say a third layer, which is um, basically we consider it's out of Afghanistan, of course. Um, and they're getting the direction from another third, I would say layer. Um, I mean, based on the, the um, track of the, the violence that we have kept since February this year, um, of course, the level of violence has kept growing and the action um, compared to the versus the talks they have is completely in contradiction with each other. What the government is doing, the government has reached to a point after the attack on Kabul University has reached to a point where we will move out of the um, active defense because it's not working anymore, attacking on a, um, how to say, a last year was, was a really successful year for us when it comes to the overall fights on the battlefields. Was a great one, um, but it was just because we have not been in a defensive mood. We didn't have a defensive policy, I would say, for, for, the, for the overall fights. But after having the different not on, on military, um, I would say, bases and the military um, uh, infrastructure, but academic institutions. And the last one was the um, The government is, is changing the policy. And that's the only way out. Over at my end. <laughs> Um, thanks very much, and we'll get we'll get back to to that as well. Um, as I already see a lot of questions coming in from from the audience. Um, Saad, I'd like to ask you a question as well, especially if we look at these last weeks. We've seen sustained levels of violence, 
Um, we've seen Vice President Saleh take over the country's security. Um, and we've also seen the media report on a lot of the, these bloodbaths and the insecurity. Um, if we look at the future of Afghanistan and the media freedom that Afghanistan has enjoyed, partly, of course, because of the US-led invasion and NATO being in Afghanistan. Um, and that's very crucial, of course, when it comes to reporting atrocities um, and when it comes to holding people accountable and recording history. Um, do you see press freedom endangered in the future in Afghanistan? Um, if you're looking at the current scenario and if, at the last 20 years and then at the crossroads and, and going forward, where do, you, where do you see the media going? And just before I answer that question, I, I think first and foremost, the, the government do, doesn't have a strategy. Uh, we make too much of the divisions within the Taliban. Um, uh, we as the Republic are far more divided than the Taliban are. That's really clutching at straws. It's been ineffective uh, uh, governance from, from our side. Terrible, terrible policing. I mean, the South, uh, we, had, we saw 150 posts abandoned by the police just in Helmand. Similarly, in, in, uh, in, uh, in Arhandab and Panjwai and Jirai and these places, it's a complete disgrace. Um, and what the, what the military is doing, which is commendable, is actually they're, they're on the back foot. I mean, the army chief goes to the South and spends three and a half weeks in the South, um, managing the fight. Now, what's gonna happen is he's gonna leave and there's always a risk of uh, those districts uh, being abandoned again by the police and the Taliban coming and taking over. So I just wanted to clarify that issue. The second issue, which I think is really important, is if the Americans decide to leave, which they still can, and ESPA's removal uh, makes it a possibility before December, there will be no uh, embassy. If, if, if they go to zero tomorrow or by Christmas, there will be no embassy. There will be no assistance to, to Afghan forces. Unlike the Najib period, they can't just give us cash and, and, and warehouses full of weapon, you know, uh, armaments and weapons to keep fighting because our whole training is, 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 is uh, conditional on the presence of, uh, of US troops on the ground in Afghanistan. That's really important to note. In terms of freedom of ex expression, freedom of press, we, we're at risk every single day and we don't trust either side. Uh, Increasingly, you can see the government is becoming more dictatorial and not uh, feeling that they have to uh, answer to, to the Afghan public. We just had a theater, as you may, uh, what Stephanie may have seen, uh, demolished with no clear plans, with no, with no uh, accountability in terms of what they're going to do with the site. They just went out and, and demolished that building as a, sh a show of strength. Uh, and of course, the frustration in Afghanistan is if you want to show your strength, why don't you deal with governance, wanted to deal with crime, wanted to deal with terrorism, wanted to deal with everything else that's going on in the country than, than tearing down this symbolic building in, in the middle of Skabul city. So my concern about freedom, it, it, it's, it's not just the Taliban, even the current environment, there is always a risk of, 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 the, of the government clamping down on media outlets because they don't like the messages. And of course, under the Taliban, it would be far worse. Thanks very much. Um, so I, in all of this, Shabnam, I'd actually like to ask you, um, of course, over the last years, we've seen millions of Afghans leave the country. There's a huge Afghan diaspora throughout the globe. Um, if you look at the peace process, do you see a similar scenario? Do you see more Afghans leaving the country? Um, and what's the response from the diaspora generally? Um, well, look, I think, I mean, the Afghan population, refugee population represents the second largest uh, protracted refugee population across the world. Um, and withdrawing from Afghanistan completely for NATO without any guarantee of peace. Um, and I know it's condition based, but there are have been sentiments. And again, it's still um, with the new transition of government in the US, um, there may be some changes in, in US policy towards Afghanistan, but from what we're hearing, um, there won't be any drastic um, changes to, to their approach. And um, withdrawing troops um, 
particularly as violence continues ac across the country, killing a new generation, um, would be catastrophic. Um, even the best Afghan army and police units are barely um, cap capable of operating on, the, on their own uh, and often lack the will to challenge the insurgency. Um, so withdrawing and possibly um, contributing to a failed state scenario, which Afghanistan is already on the brink of, again, after 20 years of international presence, um, I think will severely delegitimize delegit NATO's global role. role. Um, despite almost 20 years of massive international military, um, economic and political uh, assistance, um, you know, the country still remains beset by a debilitating array of conflict, um, Taliban insurgency continue to take territory across the country um, and um, levels of violence continue to increase and with them um, alarming numbers of civilian, ca civilian casualties as well and that all contributes to um, political and economic right migrants leaving for Europe and neighboring countries um, which then contributes to a complete brain drain and lost uh, investment. Um, I think over the last 20 years, one thing that we've all learned from it is that we do not have is that we don't have the answers for how best to support a peaceful, prosperous and democratic Afghanistan, perhaps because we've been asking the wrong questions. Um, there, I, I completely agree with what Saad mentioned just now, that it's not just the issue of how we approach the Taliban um, in um, a political settlement, but it's also how we um, build a state and a government um, that is inclusive. So there needs to be a clearer plan to address systematic problems such as corruption that undermine reconstruction and development efforts in Afghanistan. Um, missing is a political strategy to end the conflict, conflict that goes beyond a deal with the Taliban. Um, you know, we need to be able to define the kind of state that Afghans are willing to live in and that regional neighbors can possibly endorse. Um, so there needs to be a broad-based consultation of Afghans to establish the parameter, parameters of an accept, uh, acceptable settlement, and, and that includes new approaches approaches to address the long-term aspirations for sub-national power and resource sharing in a very pluralistic and atomized society. And so without changes to the political system and the constitution, um, I think in the long term, Afghanistan is very much unlikely um, to maintain a stable and secure political order. Um, and so n knowing that such a settlement could take years um, to conclude, I think, again, does, should not diminish the urgency of the process. 20 years of international presence and still it seems like we're back to, to zero. Um, and so that's where NATO plays a huge part. Um, whatever the outcome of um, the settlement, uh, the, the, the peace process, um, and whether that will take uh, many years um, um, to, to reach. Um, I think it's m more important than anything to support um, the Afghan public and, and, and um, the people of Afghanistan to be able to build something that is sustainable rather than um, leave based on very short-term gains. Um, thanks very much. And I kind of want to um, add on to that because you were talking about NATO's, NATO's role and um, this question that came in from the audience talking about uh, mistrust that was built among ordinary Afghans towards NATO forces, especially the US, the UK, Australian forces. Um, I'm going to read it out and um, I'll open up the floor to whoever would like to answer. Um, Afghan people believe that the release of the 5,000 Taliban prisoners was too early and a big mistake by the US agreement and the Afghan government accepting that. Um, the recent surge in fighting and the bombings and the killings of ordinary people is an example of that. Um, so there's a big mistrust built among ordinary Afghans towards NATO forces. Um, almost 20 years of NATO forces present in Afghanistan and the security is deteriorating as we have already discussed. Um, the situation is still bad. Um, people are victims every day. Um, so how can NATO improve that mistrust? Being the only NATO guy here, I suppose I should take a shot at it first. I mean, the, the, you can question the, and people do question rightly also, the release of prisoners. It was the only way to get the dog onto the table. It was a choice which NATO did not, you know, NATO in general 
endorse the agreement, approved the agreement, endorsed uh, Ambassador Khalilzad's uh, work. So I suppose we are, you know, all in this together. <coughs> but the Afghan government was also in it. <coughs> and uh, it was an unfortunate, an unfortunate, I mean, maybe, maybe it could have been done differently. I don't know. But the result of this is that we are the closest we've ever been to we're actually in a peace process. Now, what doesn't tally is that the Talibs have not kept their part of the bargain, bargain or have not kept what we expected or what we expected was, would have been their part of the bargain by the violence and, uh, and, uh, and not launching, uh, not launching these kind of attacks against uh, centers. The only part that they do, that they do actually keep to rigorously, is not attacking coalition troops. So that's that's you know, that's good for the coalition troops, but it's not it's not good for the for the peace process. The I wouldn't, however, make a direct link between the release of 5,000 prisoners on a force of however many thousands there are of the Taliban, with some of which have been in jail for pick five, six, seven, eight years. And so you can't imagine they're, they're completely in the, technically speaking, they are you know, in the mainstream of the Taliban strategy. I'm not sure you can make that direct link between the release of 5,000 and the increase in violence, mechanically speaking. It has boosted the confidence of the Taliban, as many other things have, and uh, so indirectly it can have contributed. I think this was uh, this, is, uh, this is actually more. I think as Ambassador Newman said, and I agree fully with that. Um, it's more a strategy on, on the Taliban side, and that was unexpected to say the least. Over. Could I just add a comment there? I'm happily not in the government, and uh, therefore I. I don't, uh, I'm not constrained in quite the same way as if I were still uh, an official. The, the prisoner release issue had major problems. First, because it was not agreed with the Afghan government. It was an American agreement. And it had the, it did push us, push forward the process and get talks started. That is a positive. The negative, though, is that it confirmed again that when there's a when the Taliban makes a problem, they go to the Americans to press the Afghan government to make a concession. That is a cycle that is a very dangerous and bad cycle because it just keeps uh, alive the idea that the Afghan side is not real uh, and that the Americans are going to pull this out. It won't work, and so I think. That part of the process, first of all, don't blame NATO. That was an, that was an American decision uh, of Ambassador Khalil Zad and the White House. Uh, I, I think it was a bad one, but there was a logic, there was a logic to it. But we need to get out of this process where the American side continually presses the government, Afghan government side for further concessions when the Taliban holds fast, because that is a way to negotiate a surrender. It's not a way to negotiate a peace. Any other comments or thoughts from the panelists? I just, I just in defense to Khalilza, I think he was effectively told by Pompeo that we're getting out. You know, find that you just, just basically window address this, this drawdown or this withdrawal in any way you can, and to his credit, and to probably Pompeo's credit, they did try to create this 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 peace process, and they had hoped that uh, any sort of momentum would allow for this thing to um, to to you know it was a case of self fulfilling prophecy, if they threw enough at it and they had the Afghans sit down. I think that history will probably tell us in a decade or so that Khalid really didn't have too much of an, too many options. But of course, he went about it the completely wrong way. He tried to bully the Afghan government. And the, on the Afghan government side, 
uh, their recal uh, recal uh, re reluctance to 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 create a very large tent to make it more inclusive from the republic side also created problems it was it was i, I just it was too rushed uh, the americans looking back were not well intentioned enough they were not honest about their dealings and of course Khalil Zad will, in time will probably tell us that he had didn't have too many options but that he could have been more honest about the whole thing and i think that that's why it worked out this way Thank you. Um, Hosna Jalil, it'd be interesting to hear from you as well. If we're looking at ordinary Afghans being the main victims of this war, um, how can NATO improve that mistrust? What do you, what, from, your, from your opinion, from your side, um, how can this be improved and how can ordinary Afghans trust um, NATO um, as well as US forces in Afghanistan? Or is this even an option? Um, well, when it comes to building the trust or reestablishing the trust between the Afghan uh, public or citizens and the um, international forces, when it comes to NATO and the US forces, um, I would say, considering that I am engaging on daily basis and weekly basis, the different uh, pillars of, of, of the um, society, including women, youth, and the elders in different provinces. I can't say, I mean, I can't really agree when it comes to, um, uh, I mean, building that trust or reestablishing the trust needed between the Afghan and the international forces. I think the Afghan public is much more unsatisfied with the US policy, but that's a political, um, um, I would say, issue. Um, but I think that the, um, I mean, what we need to do, what we are doing actually on our side is to close the gap between the public and NDSF itself. We need to give the public the trust that ANDSF can take care of their security. Um, I mean, um, when it comes to the, the operation level, I'm not talking about the financial um, support to the ANDSF, but ANDSF, when it comes to taking care of the um, security, we need to, to build that gap, uh, to, to fill that gap when it comes to the trust between the um, public and the NDSF. But when it comes to the overall like um, mentality or perspective towards the international partners, it's, it's more of a political level, um, like policy making. It's, it's not about the, the um, forces itself. We did have the unsatisfaction when it comes to civilian casualty or other stuff, but that, that's, um, I can say, uh, that's not very much relevant to the uh, prisoners release or other um, uh, issues. But I, I would like to add and echo the uh, comments or the view of other colleagues, including uh, Mr. Saad Mousseli. It was too rushed. When it comes to the prisoners release, it was too rushed. And we, um, I mean, the, the Taliban could use that opportunity um, of, of the US government being in, in, in Harry, use that opportunity in their, um, um, I would say, um, use that opportunity as, as a, for their own benefits. And end of the day, the Afghan um, public is victimized with that policy, unfortunately. Over in my end. So when you say the Afghan public is victimized, would you say that the Afghan public feels betrayed? Um, the US is leaving, the ANDSF is taking a increased responsibility and violence has been up, has been increasing. Sorry, Hosna, Jalil, this was the Well, with the increasing level of violence, there are two issues that I would consider would be, I mean, uh, yes. Do you hear me? I think we can hear you, yes. Hello? We can hear you. Yes, yes, yes. Um, do you have my voice? We do, yes, yes. We can all hear you. Increased in the level of violence. Perfect. With the increase in the level of violence, there are about a political settlement. Perfect. When we're talking about the political settlement or the, I would say, the success of the peace talks and peace negotiations, it has to be followed in order to have a sustainable uh, 
I would say, piece. It has to be followed with many other processes so that we can take that piece to the social level from a political level. And the increase in the level of violence is decreasing that opportunity of, of taking that peace uh, process towards the um, social, I mean, towards the social layers of, of the society. Uh, because the, the hatred between the, because right now I, I can say public can't forgive. They can only forget for the next generations and the generations to come. And the increase in the level of violence that even makes it quite difficult for the public and the, the victims of the war, even it makes it even um, much more difficult to forget it. I mean, forgiving has been something much more difficult than forgetting, but it makes it even much more uh, difficult to forget. The second one is the, um, it creates the mistrust or it increases the mistrust of the Afghan public on US, um, overall the US government, and at the same time, the, the values or the core values that the US came into Afghanistan. So it questioned why did they come to Afghanistan at the same time? Did they come to, um, how do I say, to, um, uh, bring democracy and the democratic values to the Afghan government, the human rights values and so many other core values that based on which they came into this country. Resources. They also, together with the Afghan um, public, and along with the international forces, they also uh, lost lives together with us. But end of the day, it um, questions. I mean, it, it creates that big question from the Afghan side and the Afghan public side and even and the about the reason why the U.S. Steph, do you want to continue? I think. Yes, yeah, sorry. I think we have some connection problems here. Yeah. Um, um, I'm not sure. Enough? Um, is everybody still here? Well, we're here. Yeah, I'm yeah, sure that the perfect. I'm sure the quality of the internet doesn't reflect the amount of the MOI pays for the internet. <laughs> um, I think it's much better, Sad. It's much better. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. I think we lost you there for a while. Um, uh, um, I hope we have you back, Hosna. I'm not sure, sure. but um, let's move to some of the questions from the audience. And as I said before, if you do have any questions for any of the panels, please do pop them in the little box on the right side of your screen. Um, and we'll try to answer as much of these as possible. Um, I'm going to start off with um, actually a question that Mr. Uh, that Ambassador Newman kind of touched on when he, was, when he explained before. Um, but the question is about the new White House administrations and what effects on the current Afghan peace talks that would have. Um, so if you could maybe elaborate a bit more on um, the, the Biden administration and the effects that this might have on the Afghan peace process. Uh, I, I'm happy to, the fact is though there's a you know, there's a knowledge gap here. The Biden administration is not really thinking a lot about Afghanistan. It's been focused on winning an election. Now it's focused on taking office, on who's going to be in the cabinet, on a lot of other issues. So th there's likely to be a substantial delay before you have a real clear American policy. That's a I don't say that with any pleasure. I just think it is unlikely that a new government that's still getting organized will have a real policy. It, it will have some inclinations. Biden has said 
that he wants would like to keep a small force. He'd like to troop his out, but th these are these are not policy decisions, and so there's going to be a, a further period of uncertainty. Now, Biden, could, President-elect Biden, could lower the uncertainty if he stated, for instance, that they weren't going to do anything further withdrawal until they've had their policy review or something, but he hasn't said anything. And I don't know if he will say anything. So that is going to mean, I think, two things, that in the military side, the Taliban will increase their combat because they will see this as a period, I, I'm guessing, but I uh, defer to my Afghan colleagues as well, but it seems to me very logical that the Taliban will see a period of uncertainty and review in America as a period to try to uh, get ahead of the Americans, to preempt the process so that there is less ability for the Biden administration to make different decisions. Um, it, so that'll be on the military side. On the negotiation side, there really will be no reason for the Taliban to make any major concessions because it won't know how hard the Americans are going to push back. It won't know how steady the Afghan side is. NATO will, NATO will carry out its commitments, but NATO will be uh, limited by the lack of a firm, clear American policy. So my guess is the immediate impact on the peace process will be further stalling. I, I wish I had a brighter view, and it, I could be wrong. Biden administration could come uh, with a stronger view on Afghanistan. It could get itself organized faster. Uh, it, it could take a stronger position of pushing back against the Taliban. All of those things are desirable, but I cannot say that they are very likely given the chaos of Washington right now. All right, thank you very much. Um, and I've seen one question pop up quite frequently, um, and that's of course the role of Pakistan in the peace process. Um, what, what role does Pakistan play in the peace process and how, how might that look like? Um, so that's one question that came up a few times from different, different people in the audience. Um, so I'd like to open the floor and just whoever would like to go first. Um, yeah, please go ahead. I, I can I can attempt to answer that. It's a complicated question, but Pakistan is is obviously very important. Um, most of these um, these groups either are either based in Pakistan or they use Pakistan for training and other purposes. And the the, the Pakistani government can play an important role. Now the debate is whether that they are they play the role or a, a role and. Um, so I think un until there's some understanding, which we all had hoped that Khalilzad would be able to um, secure, uh, given his uh, constant uh, travels to Pakistan and his meetings with the, uh, the army chief and others, that he would be able to get the Pakistanis to do a bit more. And the Pakistanis do claim that they have done some, some things, uh, but obviously it has not been enough. Uh, Bajwa was in uh, Doha recently, but we didn't see violence to go, were going down. And as Ambassador Newman just mentioned, we expect the, the Taliban to up the ante. In particular, if they think that the Americans are reassessed, they probably would want to have territory if possible. And they want to put the Afghan government in a position where they, the collapse of the regime becomes a sort of a, a fait accompli. Um, so I think you'll see a lot more violence despite the weather turning cold, especially in the south and in the cities. Um, there, in my years in Afghanistan, I understand how important the infrastructure of an organization is uh, in terms of allowing them to operate within a city. In the city of Kabul, it would be impossible to do the things that they have done, whether it's in the west of Kabul, in that school, or in, at the university, without the, the, the uh, support system. Um, and I don't think ISIS, which is a relatively small new organization, would be able to do mount such an operation without the support of, say, the Haqqani network. Um, now, again, we don't have any proof, but yet. 
uh, but it just seems very unlikely that these are different organizations. I think that they coordinate their efforts. It's very easy for the Taliban. They will obviously have deniability if they can, they can blame it on someone else and they can pretend to be the good guys. Uh, I just think that sort of all of these roads lead back to Pakistan. I think we have to always be cognizant of that and, um, and, and put more pressure on the Pakistanis. Uh, the question is how much pressure is, is the U.S. willing to put on Pakistan. And I think the Biden administration will probably be no different to the Trump and then Obama and before him, the George W. Bush administration in terms of upping the ante when it comes to Pakistan. Thanks very much. Anybody else? I think just one comment, because I, I think Saad's probably going to be right. Um, every administration has talked about pressure on Pakistan. They've put some pressure and then they eventually backed off. Uh, this is a long, complicated story, but I th suspect it may be similar. But I would also say pressure on Pakistan really can only work if the Pakistanis are also clear about what America is going to do in Afghanistan. They, they can take a lot of pain if they think nevertheless the Americans are leaving uh, and they're looking to where they have to protect their interest. So that uh, pressure is fine. It, a, lot of, a lot of issues and a lot of reasons that have never been accepted by Afghans why the Americans won't put more pressure on. But the fact is, unless pressure comes with a real sense of conviction that America is going to stay and see things through in Afghanistan, it's very hard to have a level of pressure that the Pakistanis can't live with. Uh, so that the two issues have to, I think, have to be seen together. It is possible that a Biden administration that does not want to preside over a disaster will decide that it has to maintain uh, a small force and economic support. Because after all, this is really quite easy for the Americans. There's no there's no big American political pressure to leave Afghanistan at the moment. There's some grumbling, there's unhappiness with the government, but there's no big political pressure. This is a, a Trump thing. Uh, the physical presence, the numbers of troops of the Americans in NATO are very small now. Most of the fighting is being done by the Afghans. Most of the, most of the dying is being done by the Afghans. Uh, the, the foreign role is critical for support and for training and for, for backup, but not for, uh, not for things like, you know, the actual fighting in the field. That presence is, is fairly small. It's not very costly. It's about one and a half percent of the American defense budget. Politically, if an administration wants to maintain its presence in Afghanistan, I believe it has the political room to do it. But it is just too early to say whether that will be the decision they come to. I, I wish I could, I wish I had a crystal ball or some magic and I could tell you what, where this is all going to go, but I just don't know. Thank you very much. Anybody else would like to add to this? Otherwise we can move on with some of the questions from the audience, um, which actually um, are quite, quite a nice follow up from what we've just discussed. Um, I'm going to read out one of the questions um, talking about the, the atmosphere in Afghanistan being quite difficult and pessimistic right now quoting here. Um, the question is, do the Taliban do have the capacity to defeat ANDSF? And um, in, in, in your opinion, this is to the panelists, um, the capacity building activities focused on defense and police reform, are they enough or do they need to be improved? Um, we're also looking at the Afghan local police being dismantled and what impact that might have on, on security um, as a whole. Um, so could we have some of the panelists talk about that? Well, I can take the that. Taliban compared to, compare to the Afghan forces. Well, I must think that, you know, the, the, uh, the Taliban themselves, on the first question, the Taliban themselves must have believed that the war is not winnable. 
on, on the ground and so they came to that table. Of course, there are people who believe that they came to the table to buy time and to, which might well be the case, I, I, I don't know. I'm not going to speculate, but uh, you know, the, 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 the Afghan, I don't think that, uh, we don't think that uh, the, that the Taliban can win the war against the NDSF. And uh, so, I mean, which is then one of the reasons for which they came to the table, if not the reason they came to the table. That said, one thing must be clear to everybody that this agreement was not crafted to hand the country over to the Taliban. There has to be a real negotiation. And you know, it's not that uh, I think Ambassador Newman was right. Uh, a bit more clarity. It's, it's, it's moments of uncertainty. It's, it's, it's not a good moment. It's a moment of uncertainty for every, all around. One certainty we have is that, uh, as they have demonstrated, the, the, the NDSF can, can hold its ground against the Taliban. Must more be done? Yes, of course. More and more it needs to be done, as I was saying before especially in the back office and in, you know, in this very difficult, you know, to, to, to pull up an army from zero, you need about 20 years. We haven't had 20 years. So they're a good fighting force. So they're a great fighting force in some occasions. They have some world standard, couple of world standard units. The rest is good, good enough. It's all, you know, the, 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 the back office, the, the coordination, uh, the logistics and so on, that still has to be improved. And that's what we're working on. But as a fighting force, they're, they're good. They're a good fighting force. Very good. Over. If I can just add to that, um, in terms of whether AND uh, DSF is, um, has the capacity or the resources to, to, to fight the Taliban, um, and to keep security uh, at bay in Afghanistan. While the international community in the world is focused on the landmark peace talks, understandably, um, the, I mean, most of you must have seen the Sigazni report detailing the staggering amount of money that's lost to corruption, abuse, and waste in Afghanistan in the last two decades. Um, the, the emphasis now, I think, what, what we need to really focus on as well is that um, is corruption. Um, it clearly, the, the report clearly demonstrated the endemic um, problem with corruption in Afghanistan, widespread insecurity and the lack of accountability um, that continues to make investment in Afghanistan highly risky. And so when it comes to key institutions like uh, Afghanistan security forces um, and they ca ca their capability um, to be fully resourced, trained and have the capacity to, 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 to be a strong force. Um, that's where the, the government's um, ability to, to finance um, them it comes into question. Um, I mean, Afghanistan has come in a long way in the last um, two decades. Um, but what, what, we, what, what I hope, um, and I think most of you probably hopefully will agree with this, is that um, we, there needs to be a wider conversation on the, the money that's going in um, by the international community. And that it's fully um, transparent and that it does reach the people that need it. Um, there is, of course, um, uh, in the last, in the next couple of weeks, there is the Geneva um, Conference on, on International Community Pledging for Foreign Aid for Afghanistan. Um, so that is a great opportunity for us to look at um, the way that that uh, moving forward foreign aid will be um, sent to Afghanistan, how it will be managed, because it hasn't been managed appropriately in the last 20 years. There has been major failures, uh, which is why we're here today. Um, so in, in terms of how we can create institutions and bodies that is responsible and managed by civil society, by local people, by the Afghans themselves, that can administer and provide some sort of an input on where that money is going um, and, and monitored uh, appropriately. Um, so 
moving forward, I hope even within the peace process um, and also the plans um, in terms of what Afghanistan will look like thereafter, um, the issue of corruption is very, very central to that. And the way that the, the aid and, and money that's going in is going to be managed so that every institution is fully financed um, uh, in order to carry out their responsibilities. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to add on the um, question just made uh, with three components. Um, I will br briefly add on the capability of the ANDSF and what is needed um, to be done in order to improve the effectiveness of the um, ANDSF. I can say we have got the, I would say, the youngest force at the same time the most effective um, um, in terms of capability. But in the meanwhile, um, if we look into, in, into their capabilities, particularly when it comes to our spatial force units, um, it, it is much, much cheaper compared to their capabilities. So if, if we respond um, uh, bluntly to the question, is the ANDSF able um, to defend this country and the public? Yes, they are. They're one of the, the um, I would say, particularly when it comes to our units in the region, they're, they're much, much capable compared to many other special force units across the region. But what is needed to be done, is there something needed to be done in terms of re, like reforming the, the overall um, uh, sector, um, uh, ground level, or I would say the operational level and tactical level forces? It needs to be reformed um, for, for two main reasons. The first one is to be able to manage the resources. Like the resources is getting limited. To be able to manage the resources in its best way possible so that we can provide the right, uh, the, the right and the timely support to our um, ANDSF colleagues. The second one is, um, and that helps us actually to make the ANDSF and the entire forces affordable. The second one is, um, it helps us in order to make the forces sustainable in terms of, hello? Do you have my voice? We can still hear you. Oh, we might have lost you now. Um, colleagues, do you have my voice? Yes, we do. Can I jump in for a sec? Sure. Uh, so we, this we rent here. Okay, so I just want to say this rentier economy, this artificial economy that's existed for 20 years, uh, has made the government less accountable to the Afghan public. And that's a major issue for us. And that's why this money is being spent, uh, some by the international community, um, some by the Afghan government, uh, without really scrutinizing uh, was to see what it was to you know, to, to see if, if, if it's the right way of spending this money. Uh, we generate two and a half billion if we're lucky on a, in, a, in a good year. And then we, that, that's subsidized by the international community, 50% uh, of our budget, that's another two and a half billion. And then for the Afghan National Security Defense Forces, it's five billion. It's, it's quite a lot of money. Um, there's more excitement and more nervousness about uh, conventions uh, or conferences such as the one in Geneva than, uh, uh, than answering questions in, in the Afghan parliament or getting on television and responding to reporters. So I think we have to take some ownership of our own issues. It's very important for the Afghans to start to, you know, we have to work within what we can afford really. Uh, and I think it's, it's good that the international community is helping and we, have, we, have, we are seeing some great things in Afghanistan. The, the special forces are great. Our air force has really improved. Uh, I think you, uh, you will see in a few weeks that the, the fighting in, in Helmand and Kandahar 
you know, the, the, big, the, the big factor was the Afghan Air Force, which, which is now pretty much managed and led by, uh, by Afghans, the local Afghans who have been trained outside, who've come back. Um, but the problem is also that the police continues to remain weak and inept and, and corrupt. Um, we still are not good at appointing the right people for the right positions. It's a sort of a, uh, it's the same people popping up in different parts of the country, in particular the police. The, the, the whole local police force has been a disaster. Telman fell to a large extent because of local militias. Um, so I think we have to be very honest with ourselves as Afghans and to see how we can better manage this. And maybe one thing, this threat of a drawdown and potentially over a full withdrawal is forcing the Afghans to think through how we can better improve the way we manage uh, our forces, especially the money side. All right, thank you very much. And I think we are running out of time. So I'm gonna take one more question and I'm gonna leave it up to any of the panelists to answer. Um, so we'll just have one answer before we wrap up. Um, one of the questions that came up twice, um, there are regular demonstrations, marches held by Afghans outside of Afghanistan, in Europe, in the UK, the US. Um, do world organizations, do countries care about the voices of, of Afghans? Um, are the voices heard? Um, does the world actually care about Afghanistan? I'm gonna make one comment, but I, because I'm, politically unbounded. Um, yes, but in a very limited way. Now, the good news, I think, is that with the new Congress in the United States, you will have a, a you will have a higher concern for Afghan women and for human rights. Whether that will translate into firmer support, I can't say, but you will have more concern. But I would say overall, I, can, I cannot speak for the world as a whole. I can only speak for the United States. Americans by and large are paying absolutely no attention to Afghanistan whatsoever. They are completely absorbed uh, with their election, with COVID. And also because there are very few Americans dying in Afghanistan, it's not a big story. And I've seen this before. And I, I served in Iraq before I came to Afghanistan for my reward. And uh, once we had, once the killing went down, we had still 100,000 Americans in Iraq. And you hardly got any news stories in the United States about Iraq because it wasn't Americans dying. It, that's too bad because Iraqis were dying. Now Afghans are dying. But the fact is, People focus on whether their own people are being hurt and dying. And other than that, they focus on their own problems. And so right now, I would say no. Afghan voices are not being heard by and large in the United States. It's extremely difficult for them to be heard because Americans aren't paying attention. The place where Afghan voices can make a difference is in the performance of the Afghan government because if the performance of the Afghan government and the Afghan military improves, that has an effect on foreign governments, on the American government, on the willingness to support Afghanistan. That's the place that you can have an impact, not so much with the foreigners because it's, it's too removed. Thank you very much. And I think that's a, a sobering and important note to end on um, as we are wrapping up. Um, thank you to all the panelists and also thank you to the audience for joining us today. If you'd like to listen to the discussion again, you can do so by going to the um, YouTube channel of the Conservative Friends of Afghanistan. Um, the recording will be uploaded there. Um, also do have a look at the question and then, and then comments that have been made in the chat throughout last hour. Um, so thank you all also for participating here. Um, and yes, I think we can all agree it's a it's a complex situation and an unknown future. Um, and Afghans on a daily basis um, have to live with the consequences, have to live with the violence and the deaths. And um, those levels have gone up and it's been a really it's been a really difficult time for us here in Afghanistan. Um, so yes, I'd like to I'd like to wrap up and I hope that 
everybody has been able to take something from this. Again, thanks very much for the panelists. I think we are in different parts of the world and so it's great to come together. Um, Stark here already in Kabul, so um, evening and pretty cold outside now. So um, thank you again um, for joining us. Um, I hope you're having a good night if you are in Afghanistan or a day if you're a good day if you're in the US or UK. And yes, please do um, check out the YouTube channel and listen to the discussion again and look at the comments as well. Thank you very much to each one of you for joining us today. Thank you, it was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Have a good day.